Good morning. morning. Welcome to Palm Sunday, Palm Passion Sunday at Covenant Community Church. We're so glad that you have chose to be in worship with us on this, the Lord's Day, at the beginning of a most holy week. Let me just run down the events for this week for us. Um, There will be no uh, Wednesday night uh, activities, family night supper, upper room, and midlife lessons. There will be choir rehearsal, but it will be on Wednesday of this week. And that's because uh, on Thursday, we invite you all to join us at uh, First First Congregational Church, 1024 Center Avenue, Center Street rather, over on the west side for our joint UCC uh, Monday Thursday service with communion. And so we invite you to join us with uh, with all the uh, local UCCs for that event. And then on Friday at 6 p.m. we will be having the 14 stations of the cross. We will begin at the altar, make our way around the racetrack and back to the altar for the 14 stops on Jesus' last week of life. And so we invite you to come and do the stations with us. And then at at, uh, 7 o'clock we will be having our Good Friday 10 embrace service. Uh, Did they give out, did you get your uh, your nail, can I see yours, dear? If it's gonna take that much effort, baby. <laughs> uh, usually, this, we give this out on Good Friday, but we decided to give them out today and let you take them with us. This is a reminder uh, of the uh, of the faults and the wrongdoings going in our life. And then a special thing happens at the Good Friday ten and break service. We do the we read the Passion story. And then at the end of the Passion Story, uh, a huge cross is unveiled here, and we take our nail, and we nail it into the cross to the singing of, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? It's a reminder of our identification with the Passion of Christ. And so we invite you to uh, come and be with us this Good Friday. And then we enter into the Easter Vigil, there's no events for Saturday because that's Easter Vigil. And uh, then on Sunday morning at uh, 7.30, we will be ha- uh, at 7.10, we will be doing the flowering of the cross. We invite you to pick up some live flowers at somewhere in, in, or out of your yard if you have them. Mine have already bloomed and gone for some reason already. And, and so and we'll be flowering the cross in the, in the foyer at 7.30. We'll be in here for the... Uh, the uh, sunrise service, and then at 8 o'clock we will have Easter breakfast, and then at 10 o'clock we will be back in here for the celebration of the resurrection. And so lots of things are coming up this week. Govern yourselves accordingly. Uh, We invite you to be here for that. Uh, Also, uh, although we're taking off this week, we will begin a new series of lessons, a new series, Life Lessons, on Wednesday night following Easter. And it's a new series called The Seven uh, Greatest Words of Love. You've heard of The Seven Last Words of Christ? Well, this is The Seven Greatest Words of Love. And the first word, of course, is going to be forgiveness. And we invite you to come and be a part of that. I want to thank Jeanette for covering for me this past Wednesday night. Many of you know that I had to go to Virginia and preach a relative's funeral on Thursday. And so I want to thank uh, uh, Jeanette for covering for me this past week. Uh, how, many, how many of you have a first cousin, 94 years old? That's how old my first cousin was. She was the oldest granddaughter of our generation. And so uh, she's the oldest of 18 children, I might add, too. So, and the only girl. So that was the interesting thing. I want to remind you that just uh, that the sister has an announcement about the helping hand. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first of all, we age with like to thank everyone for participating in our Bible drive. It was such a success. I mean, so much so that we can probably find another facility to donate Bibles to. So thank you guys so much for doing that. Today is the last day that we'll um, take up Bibles. Uh, if you bought a Bible, you can bring it today. Since we're having events all during the week, you can bring it during the week. We're going to um, take them Friday, and then Saturday, we're going to go to the facility, present the Bibles to them, and the choir is going to actually sing for the residents, and I hear they're so excited about it. 
So I want to thank you guys so much for participating and um, keep your ears to the ground for the next next coming um, uh, event that Bridge will uh, participate in. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. <laughs> a correction in the bo in the uh, bulletin. It, the board meeting is going to be this Tuesday instead of next week. It's going to be this Tuesday, so we invite at 715 Danko Hall. Also, uh, many of you were here for our anniversary dinner. Uh, Ron and his team did a fabulous, Todd and Jim and all of them, did a fabulous job with the dinner. And we had overages. We don't call them leftovers, we call them overages. And our, all of our overages went to First Light, which is a, uh, a shelter for uh, women and children. And they received uh, our overages, uh, and there were lots of them that day. And we have a, a thank you note in there from, from Camilla Jones down there uh, for all the wonderful things. And the one thing that I, I was so glad about, you know, my mom used to always say, they never remember when you have enough. They never forget when you don't have enough. And I'm glad that we had enough to share. With some, with some homeless women and children. And so I want to thank them for that. Amen. Our board member on duty today is our treasurer, Eric Webb. Our staff person on duty today is Deacon Jeanette Horn. And uh, if you have any questions in these, please see one of them. There will be no children's church today because of the third Sunday. And even though we don't have any birthdays this week, we are celebrating March birthdays today. And so after church, what are we going to have? Praise. Praise the Lord. I didn't get this big by not eating cake. Amen? So we want you to join us for our, after, uh, sir, our birthday reception for March in the, in the fellowship hall. Uh, we want to thank Teresa McCallum for the great Wednesday dinner this week. Amen? <laughs> this is a thank you and an announcement. I want to thank Ron Prescott for his faithfulness and his diligence to come here and clean the church each week. Amen? But he could use some help. And so if you can help him with this, please, uh, Ron, raise your hand so they can see you and you can get with him and find out when he's doing it. Uh, it's usually on one day, uh, on a certain day, but some days it's on different days. And he will be glad to contact you. Many hands make for light work, and uh, this is a way to serve your church. Amen? And so I'm asking you, if you can, please see Ron Prescott and, and help with the cleaning of the church. All things being made ready, the peace of the Lord with you, be with you. Would you rise and greet one another in peace?
Good morning. Good morning. Won't you rise in spirit and stand as you're able for our processional hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. And if you would, while we sing, please wave your palm. brothers and sisters, by his loving grace, please join me in praying our prayer of invocation. God, on this this Palm Passion Passion Sunday, Sunday, we we enter with palms and singing, all glory, Lord, and honor. Be Be present present with us in worship. Help Help us to see see through the tragedy of your passion to the the triumph of your love. love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. At the beginning of the service, we'd like to remind you that no matter who you are, where you are on life's journey, or even who you love, you are definitely welcome here. That's because we are the people of God, and we live as the people of hope. Therefore, let us declare it so this morning in our covenant affirmation. I am a child of God. I celebrate God's Holy Spirit coming into my life. Come, Holy Spirit, come. I accept God's spirit and power to inspire me, guide me, and motivate me to be a witness of the gospel, offering hope, showing faithfulness, sharing joy. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Um, we have some wonderful things going on this morning. Uh, one of the great p- things in a pastor's life is always when someone wants to be baptized and join the church. Amen? We have some people who want to be baptized this morning. Kyle Weiss, Stacy Thompson, and Jana White. Would you come forward? And face the congregation. You look different. What did you do? Oh, okay. Over on this side, babies. Amen. 
As most of you know, baptism is that special moment in a person's life when they, by, uh, they recognize by an outward sign of a spiritual inward reality, and that is that they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so Kyle Weiss, Stacy Thompson, and Jana White come to us today uh, for act of reaffirmation of baptismal vows. Uh, is this your first time being baptized? I think everybody is doing reaffirmation of baptismal vows. Would you please pray with me? Father, we thank you for being that loving and nurturing mother to us and how you nurture us with water. And so we give thanks for the creation of water and for the sustaining of life and health that it brings. We now therefore pray that you may sanctify this water for baptism so that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Kyle, Stacy, and Jana will be baptized into eternal life and live the rest of their lives through the risen life of Jesus Christ, our sovereign and our Savior. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Kyle, Stacy, and Jana, do you freely come to this point in your life of accepting water baptism as a sign of obedience to Christ's command and thereby accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and Sovereign? Would you respond, I do? Do you accept God's forgiveness for the sins you have committed in the past and turn to God whose love, eternal love, embodies you today as it was embodied in the risen Jesus Christ our Lord? Would you respond, I do? Kyle, in obedience to... Oh, quite cold, too. <laughs> God, just be thankful this is not a baptism by immersion. <laughs> Kyle, in obedience to Christ's command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Stacy, in obedience with Christ's command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. And Jana, in obedience to Christ's command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Uh, Latisse, uh, she was supposed to be baptized, and I didn't see you come on. We baptize you too. Amen? But you still got to answer the questions. <laughs> Latisse uh, hails, right? Uh, come to us for reaffirmation of baptism. Uh, sister, do you freely come to this point in your life of accepting water baptism as a sign of obedience to Christ's command and thereby accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and Sovereign? Would you respond, I do? Do you accept God's forgiveness for the sins you have committed in the past and turn to God whose eternal love embodies you uh, as it was embodied in the risen Jesus Christ? Would you respond, I do? My sister Latisse, in the name I bat in obedience to Christ's command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Would you come and pray? Right? Let us pray. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have reaffirmed this brother and these sisters with new birth by your water and by your spirit. And we offer praise and thanksgiving. And we do promise that with the help of your grace, we will uplift them. We will stand by them. And we will encourage them in accordance with the baptismal promises they've made to you on this day. God, we ask that you would keep them forever in your care and grant that all the days of their life, from this day forward, they may abide in your divine favor and your divine wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Latisse, Kyle, Stacy, and Janet, it is by the authority of Almighty God, I proclaim God's wonderful love in your life as you are reaffirmed in God's family through baptism. Let's give God the glory. You have to stay. Now, these three also want to become members. So... Reading very familiar scripture to you from Colossians, the third chapter, we read these words. Let Christ's teaching live in your heart, making you rich in true wisdom. Teach and help one another along the road, right road with your psalms, hymns, and Christian songs, singing God praises with joyful hearts. And whatever work you may have to do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, thanking God through him. Kyle, Stacy, and Jana, an extension of cordial welcome to you as you 
received into our Christian fellowship, it is becoming that you renew your confession of faith in Christ Jesus and your purpose to live a Christian life and to be publicly welcomed into the fellowship of this congregation. Therefore, in the presence of God in this congregation, would you repeat after me your profession of faith? I acknowledge my faith in Jesus Christ. I acknowledge my faith in Jesus Christ. And my purpose to live a Christian life. And my purpose to live a Christian life. Publicly declaring my engagement. Publicly declaring my engagement. To cultivate the spirit of Christian fellowship. To cultivate the spirit of Christian fellowship. And love. And love. And to seek the welfare of this congregation. And to seek the welfare of this congregation. While I remain a member. While I remain a member. All the current members of the covenant, please rise as you may. Do you, the members of this congregation who are already under the obligations of this same covenant, welcome into our fellowship this brother and these sisters? And do you promise to encourage them and help them in their Christian life? Would you respond? I do. I do. I do. Will everyone please rise as you may? Finally, we read in first these words. Therefore be calm, self-controlled people of prayer. Above everything, be sure you have a real deep love for one another, remembering how love can cover a multitude of sin. Be hospitable to each other without secretly wishing you didn't have to be. Serve one another with the particular gifts God has given each of you as faithful dispensers of the magnificently varied grace of God. If any of you preach, then preach your message as from God. In whatever way you serve the church, do it recognizing that God gives you the ability so that, you may, so that God may be glorified in everything through Christ Jesus. Stacy, Stacy, Kyle, and Jenna. You're not a Stacy, are you? Uh, it was a great joy. I welcome you into the Fellowship of Covenant. Bless me a Our prayer book is kept on the pedestal outside the Friends of Dorothy Welcome Center as you come through the front doors of the church, and it are the prayer requests and the praise reports of our people. 
On Wednesday night, one of our men, by Wednesday night, one of our prayer ministers, Jamie or Judy, will take all of these and put them on a list. And not just these, but all those that come in by the internet, by telephone, word of mouth, however we receive them. And we take the time during that time on Wednesday night to lift each one of them individually before the throne of grace. And we don't just end there, we take them with us. And we remember them the rest of the week. We invite you at any time to join us at 6.30 in the pastor study for prayer. I often say it's one of the most important things that we do here. Perhaps you didn't have an opportunity to make your prayer request known. Maybe yours is deeply personal or you just want it to be remembered as an unspoken request. If so, this morning, would you so signify by the raising of your hand? Before I go to pr in prayer, it's been a, a long week for me. I want to thank you for your prayers for the journey uh, going to Virginia to do my cousin's funeral. She was the oldest of the grandchildren of my generation. And uh, I thank you for your prayers. A little tired in body. I also want to stop and think. I may have mentioned this last week, but I'm about to shout over it anyway. I got a text from Poe this week, and both doctors says that she's cancer-free. Amen. <laughs> but we want to remember her sister, who's been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, how much is the family tend to run? We want to remember, and I'm, I'm, you, you can get up and come now. If you're cancer free, you can walk. Uh, we'll remember your sister. I guess that's not necessarily true. John, would you come? John's father, they found some uh, nodules or something in his lungs and so forth. And so we want to remember uh, John's father this morning uh, because... Um, uh, he just had, what birthday was this he just had? His 80th birthday, amen. And so we want to remember that this morning. Where's Kay? Kay, come stand here. Um, many of you know Cal. Uh, the news is not good. Um, he was the first male deacon of this church. Uh, he had a stroke this week. Uh, he cannot eat, cannot swallow, and, it's, and there's a DNR, so, you know, it's uh, just a matter of time now. And so we want to remember Cal this morning as well, as we go to God in prayer. Sister, with Thanksgiving, I anoint you on behalf of your sister, and I don't want your hair to get in the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. On behalf of Cal, I anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And John, on behalf of your dad, I anoint you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Would you just stretch forth your hands if you feel comfortable? Father, we come to you knowing that you're that loving and nurturing mother, and your healing touch is like a mom's touch. We first of all just say thank you. We see before us in Poe that prayer works, that you still are healed. So God, we lift her up right now. We also pray for this shoulder surgery she has to go through as well. But we thank you that you've brought her through a rough, difficult time. And God, we don't know what the future holds, but we rejoice right now because we see your miracle hand at work. And God, if you can heal cancer, you can heal anything else. And God, so we lay before you John's father. Lord, right now, we ask that your healing power will go out and reach him. God, we don't believe you brought him these 80 years to leave him now. And so God, we lay him before the altar of grace and we ask for your healing power. God, give John and his brothers that strength to stand in the gap 
as they go through this time. Lord, we lift up Poe's sister, and Lord, and now we see what you've done for her. We know you can do it for her sister. You're no respectable a person, Lord Jesus. And so we lift up Poe's sister, Lord, as she uh, battles cancer now. God, we lift up Cal, and we just commend him into your presence, Lord, at your time, Lord. We know the fight has been good, but Lord, we know that you're able to see him through. And God, we can go through this time because we know that to be absent from the body is just to be present with you. Alzheimer's can't reach him anymore when he's with you. The ailments of this body can't reach him when he's with you. So Lord, we just ask you to be merciful and graceful and gracious to him, Lord, during this time of transition. And not just these, Lord. All those that have made the request known, all those, Lord, who have made those unspoken requests, we lift them up to you today, Lord. Meet those needs according to your grace, your compassion, your care, and your concern for these, your people. And God, we save them, we lift them up to you because we believe that you are exceeding, able to exceedingly and abundantly, above all things that we can imagine or perceive, move in these situations. God, we lift up our folks who were baptized this morning and those who came into membership this morning. We ask for your grace and a special measure on them this morning. And so, Lord, more than ever before, we love you. And we lift up the people of this congregation. More than ever before, we need you. And so we lift up those that are troubled in body and spirit, the concerns and the community. More than ever before, we have to tell you and so we lift up our world and we lift up your church and we lift up all folks around the world today, Lord, who needs a special touch of your grace. I have to tell you, we love you more than ever before. In Jesus' name and all God's children say, Amen. from Psalms 31, verses 14 through 16. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Please rise in spirit and stand as you are able for the good news which comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 38. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the 
place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it, to, bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.
Let the veil down. Let the praises go up when the presence of the Lord. And just in case you didn't know what that veil was, there was a veil that hung in the temple in Jerusalem. Nobody could go back there. There was a golden box back there called the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of the presence of God. And only one person could go back there where that, behind that veil, and that was the priest, the high priest at that. And he could only go back there one day out of the year. And the scriptures tell us that when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was ripped in twain in half. And no longer do you have to go through a priest to get to God. You are in the presence of God right where you are. And that's what the song is talking about when it says, let the veil down and let the praises go up. Thank you. Give them another hand. Praise God. Praise God. Good job. Amen and amen. Let the praises go up. Amen. Well, today is Palm Sunday. And uh, Palm Passion Sunday, I should say. And uh, that title doesn't really reflect just today. Uh, on Palm Passion Sunday, you usually hear a sermon either from on what was supposedly Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, or you hear a sermon about what's coming up later in the week, so that next Sunday all the preachers can preach on the resurrection. It's difficult for preachers to preach and combine both of those things into one sermon, but I'm going to try to do it this morning. So if you have lunch plans, cancel them. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, let's just lock the doors. But anyway, this morning I, I want to take a few moments and I want us to look at Palm Passion Sunday. Palm Passion Sunday. Uh, I have been down this road with this before, you know, how many different ways can you preach Palm Sunday? Uh, amen? But I, yesterday, a group of us uh, were over at Canterbury uh, listening to Amy G. O. Levine, uh, who is a Jewish New Testament scholar who teaches at Vanderbilt. And one of the things that she said to us yesterday was, uh, when you read the Bible, and especially parables, but I, I took it to apply to the whole Bible, pay attention to the details. And I went home and I thought about that, and I had a rethinking of this sermon. Uh, by looking at the details, and I discovered that it wasn't what I always had thought it was. And so this morning I want to share with you the tragedy and the triumph of Palm Sunday. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that that veil is gone. Amen. Amen. We can let the veil down and the praises go up because no matter where we are, we are in the presence, in your presence. And so, Lord, right now we're in the sanctuary and we ask that you would speak for these few moments, Lord, that I may bring light and life through your word to these, your people that we may be emboldened to let the veil down in our lives, that you may manifest your presence with us, and the phrases will go up. For we pray it in Jesus' name, and all God's children said, Amen and Amen. I'm still happy about that song about there. Yeah. Let the veil down and the praises go Amen. Holy Week. Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week. And Holy Week is those seven days before the resurrection. And they are uh, seven days that literally changed the world to try to calculate the cultural impact of those seven days would be absolutely impossible. And harder still would be to try to count the numerous lives that have been transformed by what happened during those seven days. And yet, as these seven days played out, I went back yesterday and I read the story again, and as these seven days played out, they really wasn't of much significance to anybody other than the few people who were present. 
Back then, those seven days were called the Passover, as they still are called uh, for Jews today. Christians around the world call these seven days Holy Week because that's when the Passion of Christ took place. Why do they call it the Passion of Christ? That used to always befuddle me. Why do you call it the Passion of Christ? Well, Passion was the t old, an old uh, term that was used years ago to just mean the sufferings of a martyr. And so when we're talking about the suffering of J the passion of Christ, what you're really talking about when you say the passion is the sufferings of Christ. That's what it literally means. And so when you think about that, you go back and you look at how it all began. Um, it was the Sunday. It was the first day of the Passover. Jesus is preparing to make his entrance into J Jerusalem. We have come to think of it as a triumphant entry. Uh, Jesus didn't think of it that way, nor did his disciples think of it that way. But the people who were greeting him that day were the ones who were thinking of it as a triumphant entry. And so here was a day of, it was a strange kind of day, a, a day of all these contrasts. Uh, there was the climax and the anticlimax. There was the fulfillment and the frustration. There was the hosannas and the tears. There was the tragedy and the triumph. So how was Palm Sunday both of those things? How could it be both a tragedy and a triumph? Well, first of all, let's look at why it was a tragedy. Looking back, we tend to think of Palm Sunday as a tragedy because we, we are looking at, in hindsight, of what's going to happen later in the week. We know what, what happens on Good Friday ain't going to be good. And so we think of it as a tragedy, but that was not the tragedy of Palm Sunday. That was the tragedy of Good Friday. The tragedy of Palm Sunday was what the people viewed had happened on that day. And I got that by going back and looking at the details of the story. You see, excitement was running high in the city. It always did for three, three times a year. And that was those three high feasts, Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of Pentecost. It was always, those were the three feasts where every able-bodied Jew made their way to Jerusalem to celebrate. So it, it, the, the city would be running over, there would just be excitement and all of that. But this time... It was all heightened by this strange procession that was taking its place, moving towards the city gate. And at the head of this procession was this rather quiet figure of a man who was riding on a donkey. That's a strange thing. And all about him, though, it wasn't about the donkey, it was about the man. And the crowds were just enamored. First of all, I guess they were just curious, because you know how we are. We're curious first. But then they got caught up in it. And then the more it moved, they got to singing and shouting. And they got to turning the place upside down. And as he entered into the gates of this ancient city, they went wild. They were shouting, blessed is the one who comes. Bless Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And they would just grab anything they could get their hands on. And so they grabbed palms off the trees and start waving them frantically at this person coming in. Not only that, those that couldn't get some palms ripped off their clothes and start throwing them across the road as a regal carpet because they understood something's going on here. This may be the king that we've been waiting on for centuries. And so the shouts of Hosanna grew loud. You know what Hosanna means? It means save now. It's important that you know that in this story. They were shouting to this man as he went by, Hosanna, save now. And the green palms just waved even more frantically. They knew something really important was about to happen. And so singing confidently and shouting, they swept through the... And finally, this procession that was making its way in from the east, 
stopped in front of the plaza of the most sacred shrine, the temple. And it was there Jesus got off that donkey. And I imagine the crowd was thinking in their mind, well, now this is so appropriate. This, you can't get any more fitting and appropriate to start your war than right here. Amen? This is where he's going to make his big move. And they were intense with anticipation, you know, if you've ever seen Rocky Horror Picture Show, anticipation. Some of them probably glanced up at heaven because they knew that something was going to happen up there too because, you know, in their reading, was this not the Messiah? Was not this the chosen one who was going to lead legions of angels that were going to come down and, and descend from heaven and going to reestablish the kingdom of Israel? You can't imagine, begin to imagine, the anticipation and what was going on and the sensation that was going on in these people's minds. Jesus was this, going to be this one-man liberation army that had marched right into the heart of Jerusalem, into the heart in the midst of poor the poor, these poor troubled people who had lived under years of abuse and, 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 and all this under the Roman yoke of that Roman, um, pagan Roman empire. Now, the reason they felt like something was about to happen is that that wasn't the only procession going on that day. He may have come in on a donkey from the east, but there was another procession coming in from the west. It was Pontius Pilate on his huge white stallion and a whole entire military garrison following him into the Jerusalem that day. And the reason he was coming, because every, on those three occasions, Feast of Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, and Feast of Pentecost, they, brought, they, they made their show to show you that we're still in charge. We didn't want this crowd, all these folks to get whipped into a mob and so forth and start thinking that they can take on the Roman Empire. So during each one of those feasts, there was another procession that came in. And that was the Roman occupying army. And they thought, oh, they're going to get their come up and today. Jesus is here, amen? And they just knew this was the moment that had kept their faith alive for centuries. They knew this, this was their hope. This was the inspiration that had been in their worship for years. They were seeing Jesus at that moment as the right man for the right time to do the right job. Do in these Romans. And then, Jesus did not confront Pontius Pilate. Jesus got off his horse, a colt or donkey, and walked into the temple. And everybody started looking around. Well, maybe he's going in just to pray before he lead, lead the battle. And the crowd is getting quiet, except for a little murmur. I wonder what's going on. Every eye was focused on the Nazarene. What's his next move? When is it going to happen? And as the time passed, they got uneasy. There was an uneasy restlessness that came over the crowd. What's Jesus going to do? Let me tell you what he did. Gospel of Mark. Let me just read it. Jesus went in the temple, and when he looked around at everything, since the hour was late, he went out again. That was it. Uh, Bugs Bunny used to say, that, 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 that's all, folks. <laughs> he went in the temple, looked around, turned and walked out again, and did absolutely nothing. And they were stunned. Palm Sunday, that they had just been shouting about, had become this big bust. Amen? Amen. Father, there had been no event in history in the Jewish mind to that time that had ended up as a greater anticlimax as Palm Sunday. And then slowly, one by one, I can imagine, they began to rumble and walk away. And all that's left is this kind of eerie silence. What in the world was that all about? Why did I even bother to get involved with this? Why have we been promised this 
for all these years and then nothing. There had to be nothing but a totally empty feeling in the hearts of people. And that, that was the end of their shouting. That was the end of their singing. That was the end of the hosannas. That was the end of the waving of the palm branches. Something obviously had failed to come off here. Houston, we got a problem. It was a tremendous buildup and then a tremendous letdown. Have you ever had that in your life? You were looking forward to something happening. It, it, the day or the month or whatever that event started out with great promise and you were looking forward to it like you had never looked forward to anything and all of a sudden it didn't happen. Anybody ever had that happen in your life? How did you feel? Well, multiply that over centuries of anticipation of this happening, and it didn't happen. And you might understand why this was a tragedy in the hearts and the minds of the people that day, not God. And in the centuries of retelling this story, it seems to me that we often miss that point, that it was a tragedy to the first century Palestinian Jews. That event like there had never before in their eyes had they ever seen anticipated anything so great and it had failed. And so they would they was wanting a winner. They wanted a winner. They saw Jesus as finally that winner. They had been suffering. And all of a sudden, Jesus had other plans. And the tragedy was for them that Jesus had failed to do what they thought he should do. And that set the tone for his passion later that week. The hopes of the people at that moment and the passion of Christ for the hope of all people for all ages were clashing at that moment. And Jesus couldn't match their hopes in that moment with what he had come to do for all the ages. And so that planted the seeds for the tragedy that took place on Good Friday. The reason Palm Sunday was viewed as a tragedy was because it was a tragedy in the minds of the Jews of first century Palestine. They had hoped that they were going to get somebody to lead them into this war where they finally were going to be the victors and they were going to finally show those Roman occupiers who's who. And it didn't happen. It was a tragedy. But that's not the whole story. Amen? Amen? The whole story includes the triumph of Palm Sunday. And the triumph of Palm Sunday was pretty simple, even though they couldn't see it that day. The veil was going to come down. Jesus knew the veil was going to come down. And the praises would go up because... What Jesus knew the, tri the triumph was is that this is going to be a triumph of love over hate. Not, not as the world views it, mind you, the, because they saw victory as victory over that Roman army. God saw victory as victory over hate. Love winning over hate. How do you do that? Well, the veil came down. Great song this morning. Because as long as God is back there behind the veil, in that box, he ain't out there with you. He can't be there for you. You got to go around that veil and enter that sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, and then there's that big box. Oh, it's not a big box. It's about like that. That box back there, that, was, that Ark of the Covenant symbolized the presence of God. And long as it's back there, how is God operating your life in a box? That, that veil meant that God came out of the box. When Jesus walked into Jerusalem, that was the first step of God coming out of the box and being in the presence of the people's lives. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, they did not understand that what was happening, that what God was no longer in the box, but God was now in their presence. It was the beginning of something wonderful 
going to happen in their lives. It marked the victory of God in human affairs. And God's affairs triumphed over the affairs of humans on that day. And, and listen to me for a moment. As long as God is in a box or as long as God is up in heaven, we can't reach God. Amen? It's only when God comes into the midst of us, it's only when God comes into our hearts that we are in the presence of God. And because of God's presence among us, that's a triumph of love over hate. Amen? Anybody been paying attention to our political process lately? Anybody like me want to kill them all? In the name of Jesus, of course. Since we are consumed with politics of hate in our political system today, let me just use a political story from the past to show you how love can overcome hate. In the late 70s, there was uh, the Newsweek magazine carried the story of, I actually watched it on TV, of the memorial service of the former Vice President of the United States, Hubert Humphrey. People had come from all over the world to say goodbye to this man who was known as the Happy Warrior. Hubert Humphrey uh, made, got that name, Happy Warrior, because he made the Dixocrats walk out of the 48th convention when he so passionately spoke in favor of civil rights. But he also got that name because he was a fierce defender of the poor and those who were discriminated against and those who were downtrodden and the disenfranchised. But he always managed to do it without the vitriol that we see in today's politics. There was one person who came to his funeral that was shunned by everybody there, ignored by them. Nobody would even look at him, much less speak to him. It was the former president of the United States, Richard Milhouse Nixon. Nixon had just gone a couple years ago through the shame and infamy of Watergate. He was now back in Washington for the very first time since all that had happened, since he had resigned the presidency in disgrace. And nobody, Republican or Democrat, would have anything to do with him at that funeral. And then something special happened. Perhaps the only thing that could have happened that made a difference and broke the ice, Jimmy Carter was now president of the United States. And Jimmy Carter came into the room and before he was seated, he looked over there and saw Richard Nixon standing against that wall all by himself. And he went over to him with that <laughs> peanut grin of his and broadly smiled at him like he had greeting a family member and stuck his hand out to the former president. And to the shock of everybody, the two embraced like they were family members. And you could hear Jimmy Carter saying to him, Welcome home, Mr. President. Welcome home. Commenting on that, Newsweek asserted this. If there was a turning point in Nixon's long ordeal in the wilderness, it was that moment. And that gesture from a man with love and compassion what the people that day didn't know on Palm Sunday if there was a turning point in their long ordeal it was the love and compassion that was standing in the midst of them that day because God and Jesus had decided to come among them in an act of compassion and a gesture of love on their behalf. Palm Sunday is our triumph because no matter what we have done, maybe we've compromised our principles. 
Maybe we've sold out to the expediency of the moment. Maybe we've given in to our sin, whatever that sin may be. The veil is down. And God is now in the presence of God's people. We may not deserve it. James doesn't. I'm just kidding. But he welcomes us anyway. It's our triumph because no matter where we are on our journey of life, God still welcomes us in the words that you, uh, Jamie read so wonderfully this morning from, as the psalmist read, wrote. But I trust in you, O oh God. You are my God. My times are in your hand. Let your face shine upon me. Save me in your steadfast love. I would say to Kyle and Stacy and Jana this morning, your time is in God's hand. Allow the love of God to shine on you. Allow the steadfast love of God to just bathe you. This is your triumph. Palm Sunday forever will be your triumph. Amen? And if there ever was a turning point for humanity's long ordeal in the wilderness, that was it, Palm Sunday. Oh, it was a tragedy in the minds of the people who experienced it that day because they wanted something else. But God knew what was best for them. It was a triumph for God and all of us. And I wonder this morning, is it a triumph for you? Do you feel the love in your life of God? Do you feel the peace and the joy of God in your life? Do you feel God's forgiveness and acceptance in your life this morning? If you don't, you can. You can. He did it all. He gave it all for you. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you and me. This morning, do me a favor. Get your palms. This is a triumph day. And let's sing this song by waving the palms. Would you ride? Oh, how he loves you. 
Uh, if you've not done so yet, please pass the sign-in tablets around and sign your name in legibly, not with crayon. Yes, and give us your email if you've not if you've not done so or if you've changed email addresses. Um, sometimes we get lessons in life from unexpected places. Uh, and that happened to me a couple weeks ago. Um, I was reading through the 12 minor prophets. And if you know, if you've ever read through the Bible, the 12 minor prophets can, A, they can kind of be hard to read, and B, they're the last part of the Old Testament, so you're hurrying through so you can get the New Testament stuff. Um, but in the story of one of the minor prophets, Haggai, and if I mispronounce one of these Old Testament names, the pastor, yeah, okay, he will hit me. No pressure. Um, Haggai, in the time that he came along, the temple had been destroyed. Uh, the people had been run out of Judea. King Cyrus allowed the people to come back in, and they had been they had started the temple back whenever they came back in. And then they kind of let other things uh, take precedence in their lives. And so they'd been back about 20 years or so, and the temple was half built. And so then I guess that the Lord decided it was time to speak to them through Haggai. And if you read the book, it's pretty direct. So I'll give you a calm down version from Eric's RNT version of the Bible. That's the redneck translation. <laughs> and the Lord went to him and he said, so, y'all haven't, he said, y'all, so y'all haven't rebuilt the temple. I see that you've had time to rebuild some paneled houses and I guess people in Mountain Brook lived in paneled houses at that time. <laughs> so you're living in these nice houses and you've got time to plant your crops and you've got time to do all this other stuff, but you've not had time to rebuild the temple. And so as I read back through that over and over again, the thing I got out of it was, or the lesson was, that God doesn't want us to be complacent. God doesn't want us to procrastinate. And so when we talk about the work of building our church, that's a work that needs to start today. Uh, and that is a work of all of us. And that is a work that we do through our tithes and offerings, through volunteering, through our time, through anything we can do to build the temple back. Because the other thing the Lord says in that is that he doesn't just want the temple built back. He wants it built back bigger and better than ever. And that's what we want to do with Covenant Community Church. We want to make it bigger and better than ever. Amen. Will the ushers come forward?
Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts and we thank you for this church. Let us leave here today ready to do the work of this church today. Amen. Amen. God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are always better. And because the veil is down, we are able to go to God. You and I are able to go to God anytime, anywhere, and get a fresh start. So my prayer this morning is that as we prepare to receive communion, that you will allow this to be a fresh start for you. Amen. On this Palm Passion Sunday, let us prepare ourselves for receiving the sacrament of Holy Communion by saying together our general confession. Let us pray. God, you call us to see and live the forgiveness of your love for us. So we ask that you forgive us for our sins. Help us to let this Palm Sunday be our turning point of living life to the fullest, moving past the tragedy of your passion to the triumph of your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We now pause for a moment to individually confess to you, Almighty God, those things that separate us from you, from others, and from the best in ourselves. Would you go with me into a time of personal confession? <laughs> Let us join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear our words of assurance. The passion of Christ tells us of the greatness of God's forgiveness. Therefore know that God has heard your confessions, and you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Join with me in the liturgy of the great thanksgiving. God be with you. And lift up your hearts. We lift up God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is a right, a good, and a joyful thing to always and everywhere give thanks to you, Creator God. Therefore, with the angels and with the host of heaven, we lift our voices, proclaiming your glory forever, singing. Jesus was to be betrayed with the kiss of a friend. He shared a meal with his disciples. And during that meal, Jesus took bread and in giving thanks, he blessed it and he broke it. And he passed it among his disciples and he said, Take and eat, each of you, for this is my body to be given over to death for the forgiveness of sin and for life everlasting. At the end of the meal, Jesus took the cup and in giving thanks, he blessed it, and he passed it among them, saying, Take and drink, each of you, for this is my blood, the blood of the new and the everlasting covenant, poured out for the one and for the many. 
Each time that you eat of this bread and you drink from this cup, you do so to recall me into your memory until I come again. If you feel comfortable, stretch forth your hands as we collectively consecrate these elements. Loving and wonderful God, I thank you for your love and your mercy and forgiveness. And so, because of that, we can have a fresh start. And I thank you for that, God. And I ask now that you would allow these elements to become for us the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Amen. Join with me in proclaiming the affirmation of the mystery of our faith. sisters here at Covenant, we have an open communion. This simply means that you don't have to be a member of this church or of any church to come and receive communion and allow this to be a fresh start for you. At the end of the service, there will be intercessors in front of the altar. If you need one-on-one -on -one prayer, please come to them and allow them to pray for you. This is a reverent time in our service, so we ask that you keep the noise to a minimum. All things have been made ready. Please come as the ushers direct.
Oh, hallelujah. blessing and hope, what will you do? We, we will live in the, the triumph of God's, God's love. love. Praise God. And how will you do this? By, By walking in faith, faith knowing it is well with my soul. soul. Our song of celebration this morning is that great H.G. Spafford hymn, It Is Well With My Soul.
So don't run out. Run to the altar if you if you'd like to be in the pro in the in the selfie uh, uh, picture, right? Okay then, and then go eat cake. I want you to remember that today, Palm Sunday, is a triumph because the veil is down and God is present right here in our hearts. Amen. Would you repeat after me? May the Lord Lord. watch between between me and thee thee. while I go quickly to the altar (laughs) for the selfie. selfie. Amen. Amen. Come quickly. Come on. Come on. Come on. We love your face. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Hey, Leslie, can I see me up there? Yes, I can. Okay. Oh, that's good. Okay. Hey, Frank, you gonna get in the picture? Come on. Now remember, hey, ladies and gentlemen, before they take pictures, let me tell you a little secret that you'll love me for. Do not look at the camera, look slightly over the camera, you won't have a double chin. <laughs> Bobby's got more chins on the Chinese phone book. <laughs> Frank's got to get upstairs. Okay, hold on just a second. What? Not yet, not yet. Hold on. Come on here, Frankie. Got us? Oh. Yay! Yay. Birthday cake! 